or the, you know, the Protestant one she laid out about salvation is about a get out of jail free, right? Well, I'm curious to know, just kind of jump in ahead. And by the way, always talk about what you want to, right? Whether it's a reading that touched you or otherwise. But I, I did want to go pop up to this part in our workbook where we got this, this question, if, if so. Um, the first question it asked is, is the image of a drowning person true drama too dramatic uh, for what you observe when you think about salvation? Um, if so, what image would you develop to describe our human, you know, our need for salvation? So I'm curious if any of you had thoughts on what image for salvation you're kind of sitting with or hope to grow into. You're shaking your head. Does that mean you don't like the drowning thing or you don't have an image or both? Both. I don't have an image, but I think drowning is too violent an image. Mm -hmm. I think it doesn't have to be that bad before you have salvation before you can be saved. I don't think you need to be drowning before you need to be saved. Okay. I have <clears throat> I have known people for which that drowning image is applicable. I mean, literally, just going under. Yeah. <clears throat> but it, but personally, I don't feel that. Mm -hmm. um, And I've been pretty close to drowning, <laughs> yeah. to be honest. Um, and and my faith is what pulled me through that. But I I still don't identify with that image. And I'm like Susan, I don't have one to substitute. Mine was. Uh, an image of driving down a highway and turning off another route mm -hmm. and getting lost and salvation would be turning and coming back to God so when I get off in my own mm -hmm. desires and things I feel like I've turned away and that's a good one. Mm -hmm. that is. My mother used to say you can either take the high road or you can take the low road. Mm -hmm. it, it, for me, it's quality of life. It's quality of being. It's it's going beyond what is right here. Or it's going more into what's right here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Seeing the, the beauty and the, the, the divinity of this life. Mm -hmm. It's another dimension. I also see it as making choices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not just letting the stream of things take you along, mm -hmm. but actually having to make choices whether you stay on the road or you take the side road. Mm -hmm. Well, and don't you think we do that all of our life? Mm -hmm. Over and over. Life is about choices and decisions. Mm -hmm. Can I can I share mine without cutting everybody's off? That's not it. I just wanted to talk about being lost. Because when we read this, we read that. We read about the prodigal sheep and the prodigal coin. No, it's the lost sheep and the lost coin, right? Which reminds us about the lost sons not the prodigal sons, they're just lost. And um, one of the things I did in Utah uh, this year with Knowles, um, we were hiking for 25 days and I would say for 23 of those days, there were no trails. So we were in the middle of Bureau of Land Management, BLM public land. So we were allowed to go wherever we wanted to and we had to find our own way. And 
some of us liked walking in the crushed gravel and sand at the bottom of the canyon, and some of us preferred to go up on the berm where it was a little more solid. And um, we had some old maps. <laughs> there was a couple of times uh, Noel's instructors had camped somewhere and they'd put a little X where they thought they'd camped. Our instructors had never been to those places, but they would plan that we would go to this X the next day. That was where we would set up camp. And I can tell you one night we went there and we were like, what the hell were they thinking? There's, <laughs> there's no water here. It's not flat. And we weren't even totally convinced that we were on the X because it was a pencil drawing and it's not done with GPS. It's, it's done on a map with grids and a little protractor. And one time we were looking for one of these X's and we had three groups and each leader and each group disagreed about where the X was <laughs> because we were looking at a map that had contour lines every 40 vertical feet. Seems like a lot, but we would come up and there might be a 37 foot drop and it wasn't on the map because it wasn't 40 feet. So it was really hard to verify that this is where the X is. Um, so I was just sort of thinking about that, like maybe there's not a way, like, hey, the highway and turn off and now you're off the road, but maybe salvation, when I think about being lost, is about getting better maps and truly, if you like to walk in the gravel, great, God will go with you. If you prefer to walk on the slick rock, great, God will go with you. So it's not like one is worse than the other. But at the end of the day, where do we find water? <laughs> where do we set up camp? And do we walk in such a way that we destroy the route for other people or not, right? So in Utah, there's this soil that takes a thousand years to grow called cryptobio bi cryptobiotic soil. It starts to turn black and it's it's just, it takes years and years, hundreds of years to develop. And if you step on it, it's gone. So you can step on this stuff and you've killed a thousand years of development, right? I don't think it would be salvific for us to trample the crypto. <laughs> it actually infects the environment, right? And it's not salvific to cut the switchbacks because that hurts the way for other folk. And so I know I'm really drawing this out, but I but I guess I'm thinking about salvation as replacing bad maps with better maps and making sure that we end up at the same place together that's sustainable and that we don't ruin the way for people who are coming after us. Because if you cut the switchbacks, you're going to create erosion and you're going to make it really difficult for other people. And if you step on the crypto, you've really hurt the environment. And that whole environment bit reminds me that salvation isn't just about my own choices. There's systems of choices, right? So, hey, great, I've been personally delivered from bigotry, and yet there is a system in which a Black man will get 90% of what I make because of his skin color. So we need salvation, me from personal prejudice, and everybody from systemic racism. Does that... Mm -hmm. That's good. And I think about maps because, you know, like psychologically, there's this whole thing about map theory, right? And you know this better than I do, right? But we have these internalized maps, right? Came from our parents, came from our DNA. And sometimes like we're really good at doing this thing that we hate doing, but we're so good at it, right? <laughs> and this, I think, is salvation is like, well, how do we iron that map out? Because we've got bulges in our cognitive maps. And, and again, like we're really good at them, but they can really like make the journey not fun. And they're familiar. They're so familiar. It's easier to go where you could have been gone before. And most, if you've had kids, right? You, when you were a kid, you said, I'm never doing this. <laughs> and then you find yourself, well, it was good enough for me, right? <laughs> I mean, like, like, you know, this is what we do, right? I know how to do this. Because I've got it in my map, yeah. right? Like I know that map. We hear our mother's voice coming out of our mouth. Absolutely, we do. And and that's where I think of salvation as like, let's update the map. <laughs> because great, mom got us here, but we would like to go somewhere else <laughs> sometimes. Or or maybe other folk need us to go somewhere else. I've totally lifted off the whole punishment thing. And that's really important for me because, you know, at the time this is written, 
eternal life was like a novel idea. So when you read eternal life in the Gospel of John, it really it doesn't mean the way we understand it. It's like heaven when you die. It, it's really about a quality of living, not a quantity. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. When they when they a whole lot more so talk about eastern versus western, mm -hmm. yeah. and the western has an angry God and the eastern doesn't. I was going like, well, maybe that's me. Maybe I should be more eastern, you know, because yeah. I don't, I don't have that concept of God being us. That's this is why I like the idea about there's not a super highway God intends us to travel. We're all on our way, and we make individualized decisions. And you can do that in a hiking group, and it's great. It's called challenge by choice and respect your preferences as long as they don't lead you into danger. So again. You want to wade through the creek, you do it. I don't like getting my shoes wet, so I will. My instructors got frustrated with me. They were, and they wrote on my evaluation, like, sometimes takes unnecessary risks to avoid water hazards. <laughs> <laughs> Hazard, underline. <laughs> do not want my feet wet all day. So I would climb around, and they were like, why are you doing that? I don't want my feet wet. That's not wrong. It's not like God says, Get your feet wet or go to hell. And that's why I, I try to like free that up because it's in, it's important to me. Um, and to just load off the whole punishment thing, right? It's not like if we make one wrong turn, wrong turn. It's look, mm -hmm. we're in the wilderness. There are some paths. If you choose to go off the path, do it respectfully, intentionally, thoughtfully, know your limits, right? I mean, this is like, this is what, what we do. And the goal is that we end up Together. <laughs> um, this is kind of crazy, I guess, but for me, heaven and hell are right here within us. And the choices we make create that for ourselves. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and using your imagery, maps, we need better maps to get us one place or another in terms of, again, quality of life. I mean, and I, this is why we revised the prayer book, I think, because we realize words are maps <laughs> and maps change and language changes, right? So we could use the Elizabethan service, but what would it point us to? Because the language has changed, e.g. the map has changed, right? So we need to revise our maps. Like I would tell you, I've heard this, you've heard me say this before. If you're a woman, you don't exist in the prayer book. Yeah. Mankind, he, that's it. Yeah. I think we need to change the map to humankind. Mm -hmm. Us, we, sisters, brothers, to, to combine. They, y'all, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I don't think it's politically... It's not political correctness. It's a map. <laughs> it's not a thing we do just to do it. It gets more people to the destination, I think. I'm going to give you one other image that's not mine. And like I said, I don't want to have the last word. So if there's other images, please. Um, Episcopal priest Barbara Brown Taylor, and you've heard me say this before. She says, salvation happens anytime somebody who has a key unlocks a lock that they could just as well have locked. So salvation is about opening doors that we could shut. Salvation happens when somebody says, hey, I'm gay and I want to get married. And we say, can I come instead of abominable? Just as an example. Yeah. And I don't want to universalize that. You're welcome to your own opinion. But salvation also happens, right, when somebody says, hey, I've got a felony conviction and I want to work for you. And we say, let's think about whether we can make this work instead of categorically, no, you're a felon, we don't hire, right? That's that's a lock we can control when, when we're employers, right? It also is paving the way for the generations that are coming behind us because we're improving, yeah. you know, by changing the wording in the prayer book and we're continuing to improve, to to show those younger people that this is not the only way. 
And I love, I love that you, when you think about it that way, in a whole map making analogy, right? That there's room for adventure mm -hmm. and there's room for pioneers. And maybe they come back and they say like, that was not a good route after all. Right? <laughs> or they say that route will really accommodate a whole lot more people. <clears throat> the obstacles are way less severe. Let's go that way. Cause I've, I've done it. And any hiker comes back from a hike and says like, I'm doing that again, or whew, there's a big world that was just fine, or <laughs> nope, not doing that again, right? And that's that's really, a, you think about it, that's a way of evangelism. I found a way there. I found grace there. I found beauty there. You'll probably enjoy it too. And we do that all the time when we go to a new restaurant, yeah. read a new book or do a movie, right? We say like, I found life there. I pioneered and I enjoyed it. And maybe you want to try that way. <laughs> well, you know, you talk about um, redrawing the map. One of the things I've learned uh, is that the Roman, the Roman Catholic Church is in a big upheaval right now and uh, <clears throat> with their synod. But the German Catholics are the ones who are now accepting gay marriage and um, the other thing that is forbidden, oh, divorcees. Because in the Roman church, you know, you, you'd have to get your marriage and all, and all that other stuff. Uh, whereas, uh, and so the, 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 all the bishops of Rome have met with the officials. I mean, all the bishops of Germany have met with the officials in Rome because they, the Germans will not change their stance. So that is uh, one that will, it, well, it's long overdue, but that's an example of a, a map being written that is contemporary for our times, and we we need that also. Yes, yeah, Susan. So, so in here, they spent a lot of time talking about the Old Testament view of Ugh. salvation. Yeah, the human. Mm -hmm. Versus the New Testament view of salvation. And it's interesting that the video didn't talk about that at all. Yeah. yeah. It's also interesting to me that the book uses what I consider the abominable phrase Old Testament over and over. And over. Yeah, yes. Yes. yeah. Well, I think the way the, the video tried to talk about it was in that liberation theology perspective, which when you think about it is really about remapping systems, right? Like, mm -hmm. hey, there's individual change and there's also like real political disparity that needs to be resolved. And mm -hmm. that is the image that you get mostly in the Hebrew Bible, right? Is like, hey, we need an exodus out of the things that are binding us. If you want to read that guy, like the guy is Gustavo Gutierrez, mm -hmm. uh, who came up with liberation theology, and that gets mapped out. There's a guy called James Cone that talks about black theology, which is a specific liberation version in the United States for folks who have grown up under the vestiges of the African slave trade, right? So you, you get this mapped out in a lot of different ways that say, like, here's what salvation looks like if you're Native American. Here's what salvation looks like if you're a black woman. That's called womanism, right? So, so there's all these different things that say like, sure, it's about individual choice, but these are the systems that need saving, if that makes sense. We're talking about images of salvation. Oh, yeah, no, oh, it, it's fascinating. <laughs> As a Hispanic growing up, South grew up in South Texas, speaking Spanish before English, thinking, hmm, where did I fit into this? Yeah, or my people. Did, it, did anybody else have images other than the drowning one that you kind of think of? I, keep, I don't know if this fits in. I keep thinking about Sadie Atkins and Tex Watson from the tape, Love Bianca. Murders. And later in prison, they both um, converted, and I think Tex even did preaching and stuff like that. And I have a hard time thinking God forgave them. I don't know why. I mean, I guess it's possible, but is there 
or a pedophile. I mean, at what point? I mean, I don't know. And then I say, well, who are you to judge what he does? You know, but it just, you know, she wanted to cut the baby out of her. I mean, you know, yeah. and then, but then I kept thinking, well, now wait a minute. To what extent were they brainwashed by Manson? But still, and so I just wondered, is there some point where God doesn't forgive us? Of course, I'm sure he can see hypocrisy if they say, oh, you know, and do all this praising and stuff, but he sees what's really in their heart and mind. But, and then again, I, I say, well, who are you to judge? So and I have this conflict. I think you've really laid your finger on something that's really, really tough, which is like mm -hmm. how we live in society mm -hmm. and what about, and how do we use religious language for how we live in society? And I actually think it's really dangerous yeah. when we confuse those two and say like, hey, when you commit a crime, you must be punished because God punishes people. Because <laughs> that's conflating two things. Accountability for living socially and, well, God's God's love or God's action when things don't go right. And, and um, I struggle with it, too. But like cognitively, like I think my theology tells me, like, there's nothing unforgivable with God. There's nothing unforgivable. Uh, and yet there's also accountability for what we do. And most of the accountability, I imagine, is not that, honestly, that God needs to, like, give us a switch. I mean, we we get natural consequences for what we do. And sometimes they don't come, right? Sometimes we speed and we don't get a ticket or, or you know, whatever it is. And we start to think, like, well, that's because the world's unfair or unjust. Or where's God? Why didn't I get a speeding ticket? Usually we think, why didn't he get a speeding ticket, right? <laughs> not, we usually think like, woo, thanks God, I didn't get one, right? So, I mean, I, th I think we do all this conflating in our in our heads. And, and I think part of that is because sometimes we think that God has to have the same accountability as we've chosen socially. And that's why people go to hell forever. But I don't know anybody. And I think, I mean, I'm going to, We've got an expert in the room, but I don't think anybody says, boy, when I grow up, I want to be a pedophile. I just don't think anybody says, like, that's my life goal. Instead, I think people have, I don't know, epigenetic factors and people have social factors. And if you don't mind me saying, I think pedophilia is a mental illness. Like, I think it is. Mm -hmm. um, and there still has to be accountability for what we do in non-consenting relationships, which would be any relationship between a child and an adult. That, that is not consensual because there's not equality. So there has to be accountability to protect people who cannot protect themselves. We do that. What does God do with it? Well, directly, God doesn't seem to do anything about it, if you don't mind me saying. Well, you know, I find... He created all of us. And, and it says right in Genesis, everything he created was good. So I have a hard time kind of reconciling that with what God has created as good. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me see if I can try my hand at that, right? Like God created intimacy and called it really good. Mm -hmm. And God created physical sensations of pleasure and called those very good. Mm -hmm. So those are good. Those are good things. God also created mutuality, which I think is really good. So what happens anytime there's something like rape? Well, there's no mutuality. There's not mutual pleasure because that's force, right? Um, it's, and so, right, that's taking things God created and made and called good and putting them into categories that are not good. <laughs> that's that's how I understand it, right? So didn't he create the ungood too? 
Well, I don't know. So like, I just, and I'm going to think through these tough, these tough things, right? Like, and let's talk about intimacy. That's a good thing, right? I have a child. I like to be intimate with my child. Sometimes that looks like snuggling or sometimes that looks like hugging. Mm -hmm. Is that wrong? Mm -hmm. I think it's pretty lovely right now. If you want to come hug and snuggle my kid, you better know her because yeah. <laughs> she'll tell you no thanks, right? Okay. She'll tell you no thanks. Um, so look, like, like in the general category is very good. And look, you may find yourself thinking like, boy, intimacy for me, I only really understand that sexually. Like it's not intimate if it's not sexual. I think a lot of people map intimacy to sexuality especially the first two years that they're married. But after like seven years when you're married, I think you start to realize like the two are not the same thing. Maybe you've already realized that. I think that's healthy realization that intimacy does not have to be sexual. And this is a confusing thing in America, right? That if two men hold hands, it's because they're gay. But if you go to other countries, men hold hands when they're friends. Consider that if Kay said, I'm going to Galveston for the weekend with my girlfriends, we would say, Hope you have fun. If I said I'm going to Galveston with my boyfriends, you would say, are you gay? <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? So this is like a, and all of this is cultural. You, I hope you hear how we culturally define these words, right? It, however, I think what we've decided is intimacy really only works when two people are relatively equal and they both are in, <laughs> right? This is why. I don't care what you think about whether she consented or not. This is why I would tell you Bill Clinton absolutely raped Monica Lewinsky. Even if she was willing, she wasn't equal. <laughs> he is the president. She's an intern. There's no equality there. Does, does that make sense? Now, you could say, well, she knew what she was doing. He knew what he was doing. I was not okay. And he knew who he was. And what his position was. He knew all that. Is his desire for intimacy God given? Yes. Is his desire for physical pleasure God given? Yes. Is his desire to have a relationship with other human beings? Is that God given? Yes. Did he put those in the right map? No. Yeah. Salvation is about redrawing the map. Not just for him, but for her and anybody else who works for him or folk like him. Right. So it's not just about he needs to be saved. It's we as a society need to say, no, that's not OK. And if you do that, here is how we will hold you accountable. And the fact that we're willing to give you a trial means we recognize you're worth a trial. I mean, this is kind of how we've set up trial by jury in the Constitution. Right. Even if I catch you in the act, you still get a trial. We still have to hear evidence. I, I think the hardest thing for us is conflating accountability with fundamental dignity. Fundamental what? Dignity. Yeah. And when we say something, like, if we say, if you say Hitler was not a human being, then you can't hold him accountable. Because if he's a monster, he's doing what monsters do, and you should expect that. If you say, however, he's a human being who must be held accountable for inhumane decisions. You can put a human being on trial for inhumanity. You can't put a monster on trial for inhumanity. They're supposed to be monsters. Do, do you hear what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't take away from accountability to hold on to dignity. In fact, without dignity, you can't have accountability because they couldn't do anything other than what they did. And what they did was trying to fulfill a God-given need in a not good way. <laughs> I, I don't know if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, um, with, uh, with regard to uh, why people do things, so a lot of, uh, there are times when it's how their brain is formed. Mm -hmm. For example, schizophrenics. You know, they don't, nobody picked that out to be a schizophrenic for something that they have no control over. So, I mean, I, 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 uh, I'm just saying there's another aspect here that I think we just need to be aware of uh, because I agree totally 100% with, with Mike, but uh, I, I just wanted to do that. So.
And I, and I do think that's the hard bit, right? Like yeah. I told this story, I drove by these guys who were stealing wood off of our wood pile. And I said, if I see you again, I'm calling the police. <laughs> I wish I'd called the police instead of telling them that because that would have been a much more enforceable move on my part, you know? Um, I, I don't hate them. I know the work it took to get that wood out there. And I know that our people did it and it was really disrespectful. They didn't know that or think about it. They just they didn't even think about it. They just saw it. They just thought they could have it because it was there. Okay, so now <laughs> I watch a lot of true crime. Can you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so now I'm thinking about Ted Bundy. Okay, and these serial killers mm -hmm. and some of them. And like you were saying, you know, when they were all, when all of us were born, including them. We were just innocent. We were just, you know, and and at what point? I don't know where I'm going with this now. I remember when he was, I think, four. His aunt was living with him, and she woke up, and he had knives standing next to her in the bed. That's a young age to, mm -hmm. you know, and so I think in some churches, religions, they would call people like him and Hitler, you know, or the devil's own, you know, it's the devil's work and all that. And I mean, if if he had asked for forgiveness at the end, after everything he did, would God have forgiven? And I don't know why I wonder these things. You know? Yeah. And I then maybe it's just you have your schizophrenics, you have these, you have those, and that's just the way it is. I don't know. Well, can I ask a terrible question? It's, this is terrible, and you don't have to participate. I'm just going to ask. How many do you think? How many? How many of you think that if Ted Bundy had asked for forgiveness from God, he'd have got it? How many of you think that? If he was sincere? How many of you think if Ted Bundy asked for forgiveness from God, he would not have got it. How many of you think God would have forgiven him whether he asked or not? Uh, I think he has to ask. I think he has, he has to have a change of heart. This is why we did grace first. Grace is an unmerited show of favor. Does God give us grace? Yes. Do we have to ask for it? No. Oh, there you go. Okay, there Caught you, you go. Off. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly now, how does God express grace to folks like Ted Bundy? Well, don't you we quit in grace and salvation? What did you say? He's, are you equating grace and salvation? I might be doing that, and yeah. you might not be doing that. So that's a good point. Are grace and salvation the same thing for you? And if not, how are they different? Well, they're different because Grace says, Ted Bundy, you okay? <laughs> and I don't, and then I get lost. <laughs> so this is where the terms we got from the reading might be helpful. Can I reference some of those terms? Yeah. This is very Wesleyan. Wesley talks about salvation as comprised of a couple of movements. Remember, we, we read him last week too. Prevenient grace is the grace that enshrouds you without your active choice. It's there. Even if you reject it, it's still there. Then he talks about justification. Justification for Wesley is this moment of salvation that God gives you where you're living way out of source. You've really tipped the scales. And let's talk about naughty and nice. The naughty list is really heavy. Justification happens and the scales are even. Mm -hmm. So this is the this is justifying grace is your put in the book of naughty and nice, the ledgers that evened out. So the scales are set. And then Wesley talks about sanctification. Sanctification happened after justification, and it's really where you live into the joy that God had intended for you. So it starts to like weight the scales the other way, right? So if I put this language together, perhaps grace is this, and then salvation is when we live into this. Does, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 
So, mm -hmm. so if you want to parcel it out, you could say God justifies everybody in the end, mm -hmm. and it's our invitation to be sanctified now. That's my heaven and hell being present, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, and I think Same let's thing. make it really, really humdrum, right? You're an alcoholic. When you reach sobriety, you're at justification. When you start to really live into your sobriety and be present, that's sanctification. And that's where we get the term, he's a dry drunk. He's not drinking, but he's still doing the things that create the hell for him right now. Yeah. And I want to ask you about something you said here that with regard to Ted Bundy, uh, whether or not God would have forgiven him had he not even asked for it. And uh, you said yes. So then why do we need to bother about anything then? In other words, it's no matter what we do, God's going to forgive us. What's the problem? Uh, I mean, go have a good time. Good yeah. Time. Yeah, I think you see the you, Protestants teach that. She had to help me. And that's why you, they, um, oh, I'm not doing well. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then you wonder about doing confession once a week. Okay, I confessed. I'm okay for last week. Now, what can I do this week? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to confess next year. Yeah. Here's the argument this is super easy, and I want you to, like, it depends how hard you take this. What needs does God have? What needs does God have? Yeah. What does God need? God wants to be loved. Is that a need or a desire? I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's a lot riding on the question. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just put, I, I think this is one of those fundamental variable questions. Does God need your love or does God want it? Wants it. He wants it. He wants it. Yeah. Does God need your prayers? No. God needs needs for us to need Him. I I, I don't know. That, that sounds so. God's needy. Well, oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> you, you 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 see at the bird's eye point how this becomes sticky really fast. Mm. Does God need you to be baptized to give you grace? Why do we do it? Well, the church says right, right, because right. it's a map for us. Yes, it's okay. a map change for us. Does God need you to be sorry for you to have the Eucharist? No. No. So I could be totally cavalier and go up and get the Eucharist, and it could still be an act of grace for me. No, it could possibly. Continue. Is the grace of the Eucharist contingent on the way I receive it, or is it contingent on what God gives? This is why we had the Reformation, folks. Yeah. Is it contingent on what I do, or is it contingent on what God does? Can, can you ask the same question, of that question with relationships? When you, not God, but another person. When you go to, to become, develop a friendship, whatever it might, what level of wherever it is, do you do it? Oh, I'm going to be confused. Because that person needs it, or because you need it. Well, it's a great question, and I, I think maybe a different way to phrase that is: Are relationships investments, or are they gifts? Now, I have investment relationships. Like we understand, there's a thing we're supposed to do, and if that stops happening, the relationship's pretty much over. Yes. Yeah. Yes. On the other hand, I have relationships that are gift-giving relationships. And honestly, one person is usually more in it than the other at any given moment, yeah? And I, in fact, I have some where I think, boy, I really love this person and I'm really trying to love them or not getting a lot back. And I stay in it because I actually, I love them. Yes. <laughs> like my children. So, so like, <laughs> I stay in it because I love them, even if they don't show me stuff back. Do I need them to love me back? Mm -hmm. I really want them to, but I actually don't need that because I've chosen to love them either way. I have chosen, I will love them regardless of what they do. Now, I will enjoy that more or less depending on what they do, right? Mm -hmm. It will be gratifying depending on what they do, 
but I'm going to give it either way. I mean, just, I really am going to give it either way. Yeah, parenting, parenting is absolutely. This me. is all analogy because look, God isn't like us. We can be like God, but God is not like us. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to tell you as your priest, I think, I don't think God needs you to think anything about the Eucharist. I don't think God needs you to think anything about baptism. In fact, I don't think God needs you to be baptized or take the Eucharist. Why do we do it? I think we need it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Does God need you to confess? I don't think so. I think we need to confess if we want to enjoy the forgiveness God wants to give us. That's what I think. So are you saying you don't need to be a Christian? Yes. Yeah. Christianity is my map. And I can't change it. I mean, but it's Jane, our map. Well, it's mine. I mean, civilization. Mm -hmm. no. this, in this civilization, it is. Yeah, I mean, look, if I was born in Saudi Arabia, I would not be Christian. I wouldn't. No. And actually, it would be like terrible for my family if I converted because they'd kind of get excommunicated and I'd probably get my head cut off. That's no. a big cost to my family. Mm -hmm. No. And the reason I'm here in church is because I was grew up in church. If my parents had been Buddhist, I think I'd probably be Buddhist. I'm just honestly, mm -hmm. this is the I brass test. So I think yeah. if yeah. you're born into a Buddhist family. Do I think Buddhist people Buddhist. need my man? I don't think I Buddhist don't people think. need my map. No. I do think there are great ways we can improve our maps together. Because yeah. I think God is bigger than what I believe. There, she raised an interesting question. I'm just reading a book called *Sapiens* by Yuval Harari. Oh, yeah. what? *Sapiens*. Sapiens. It's an anthropologist. Uh, okay. Yuval Harari. Controversial book, but yeah. Yeah. And he he talks about religion, uh -huh. and it's I'm trying to I'm trying to wrap my head around that right now. Because religion is a way of a group of people communicating with each other. Common language. Common language, yes. 